Hello, welcome to the Julia Khan, uh, no, Julia Khan, the podcast. <laughs> Uh, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in and thanks for everyone who's been uh, waiting with, with us for the past uh, 21 minutes. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties, but hopefully from now on everything's going to be okay. Uh, also, thank you for everyone who watched the previous episode and gave us a lot of amazing feedback and uh, notes for previous, uh, sorry, for future episodes. Uh, we did uh, we already uh, are incorporating some of these notes in this today's episode, so uh, we're excited about that. And we'll hopefully incorporate the rest for um, the next episodes. Um, my name is Huda, and I'll be your host for today. My uh, co-hosts are uh, Keno, if you want to say hi. Hi, and, Keno. <laughs> and Nathan, uh, also, if you want to say hi. Hello, uh, Again, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, for today, uh, the format's going to be a little different than uh, the previous uh, episode. It's going to be a little longer, and we're going to have three main segments. Uh, the first segment will be uh, kind of a follow-up or uh, kind of catching up from when, where we left off uh, in the previous episode, where like we commented on a few uh, items there. We'll just bring them uh, back and um, say what follow-ups we received from um, the Julia community. And uh, the second part will be a series of interviews with amazing uh, interviewees from the Julia community. We have a great lineup. We have uh, Valentin, uh, David Sanders, and uh, Jacob Quinn. Uh, so yeah, uh, stay with us for that. And then towards the end, we're going to end with some uh, notes uh, or like some just general news about uh, JuliaCon uh, or Julia, the language related news. And we'll have a quick hi from, uh, should we say, just say a surprise or just, just say Chris or Caucus. <laughs> we'll come, we'll come by and say hi. Um, and yeah, we'll just end with some uh, quick notes. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the episode is kind of packed. Uh, so why don't we just uh, go ahead and get started. Nathan, why don't you take us from where we left off uh, last episode and pick up from there? Okay, yeah, we will. Uh, I'll do that right now. So uh, last episode, we gave a highlight of what we're going to cover. Um, and we promised to include uh, uh, tidbits and stories uh, collected from the community from this year's JuliaCon, as well as resurfacing fun stories and memories from JuliaCon's past, which is, of course, a favorite activity of people whenever they gather, is to reminisce. Um, so um, I'm going to just start with that. We talked about last time, we talked about the Julia 1.0 launch, which happened at the JuliaCon uh, two years previous in JuliaCon 2018. And Keno shared the story of how he filmed the whole thing on a shaky camera phone because we uh, didn't think that there was any other way to, oh, because the live stream was down. And so uh, uh, Keno had had decided to live stream it from his phone. And um, so we we were told a correction from our community that actually there was a proper video footage recorded during the event from the fancy camera. Uh, it was just never published anywhere. So we have never before seen fancy camera footage that we're going to show you right now of when we uh, tagged Julia 1.0 at the Julia Con 2018. Play it, Keno. I think, doing it? I think we've got enough of that. Right. Are, are we, are we going to try and get a drum roll? Or? Uh, this is the moment that Julia 1.0 gets tagged at uh, Julia Con 2018 two years ago, as seen by the professional camera. And maybe in the edit, we'll also edit in the uh, shaky cam version for comparison. Yeah, so on stage we have, uh, of course, Jeff Bezenson, uh, Viral Shaw, and... Uh, Alex Arslan. Ar yeah, that's Alex Arslan at the computer. And, and I think Stefan is in the background. Yeah, Stefan is hiding behind Jeff. So, uh, yes, that was uh, just one of the many fun uh, memories and uh, videos we'll share from past video cons. And um, also, please send Valentine us... Also, thanks for sending the video, right? Yeah, thank you so much, Valentine. Yeah. I was about to say, thank you so much, Valentine, for sending us this video. And uh, please, uh, other people out there watching this uh, who are attending this year's JulieCon or who have memories of fun events in previous year's JulieCons, in the link below in the description, 
Um, you can find uh, the feedback form that we'd love to have you fill out and send us more. You can upload right through that form more fun videos like this or pictures from previous Julia Cons. We also want to real quick share um, Elliot. Thank you so much, Elliot Saba, who sent us also some fun memories from Julia Cons past, um, including, I can actually just share this one right now. Um, including this lovely photo uh, of people getting some social time at JuliaCon. Uh, and yet, uh, despite meeting together in person, everybody here is just on their own camera, on their own computers. So uh, maybe this year's JuliaCon isn't actually as different uh, from past year's JuliaCons as you might have thought. Um, and I think that's mostly it. The la last thing we wanted to do is we wanted to say thanks for all 10 people who filled out the survey in the link below. Please also do the same. <laughs> and fill it out. Um, Nathan, we also have a picture of Kano while he was holding his phone. I think Elliot sent that picture too. That is true. Yes, here, here's another yeah. one. Okay, here's another great photo that we got from Elliot of the event you just watched. Uh, here's yeah. Kano holding his phone during the yes, entire hour with the, long. With the like, shaky cam version. One hour and whatever. Minutes. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, so thank you for that. Elliot, thanks for those photos. Please send more if you have them. And then some other quick responses that we got that we wanted to read uh, and say thanks for. Um, uh, someone suggested, um, if you are currently in Lisbon uh, or in Portugal generally, for whatever reason, if you decided to go there anyway because you didn't cancel your flight or if you happen to already be in Portugal for any reason, please send us all photos of Portugal so that we can uh, get a little bit of the Lisbon experience that we're missing and feel like we're there together. Um, that would be great. So thanks again for all that feedback. Please send more uh, and send us also people who you want to get interviewed um, so that we can talk to them in follow-up episodes. And now I'm going to hand it over to Keno, who's going to talk a bit about the workshops coming up. Yes. Um, so quick preview just about the uh, workshops tomorrow. So we already uh, mentioned the SciML workshop, and we're going to have Chris later. So. Uh, no more about that. But the other workshop coming up tomorrow on Sunday um, will be uh, CXX Wrap. So CXX Wrap is a package for calling C++ code. So you may know the two primary packages we have in Julia for calling C++ code are uh, CXX.jl, which I wrote a long time ago, and uh, CXXWrap.jl. Uh, so sometimes people ask me which one you should use. And the answer is, if you want to do something cool, use CXX. If you want something that works, use CXX wrap, because CXX, while very cool, um, has a lot of issues um, that I hope to get to eventually. But in the meantime, if you need to get things done and you need to call C++, CXX wrap is an excellent package. Um, and there will be a workshop on that tomorrow at, I believe, 10 AM again, right? That's, yeah. yes. The workshops all at the same time. So 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific. Anyway, so yeah, uh, attend uh, uh, by Jensen's workshop um, uh, uh, tomorrow on CXX Well. And uh, we're almost ready for interviews. But before we do that, I do have one more item, which is that I promised I'll show a little bit of video footage from prior Julia Cons. And I don't have a lot, so we're going to split the, spread this out a bit. But the first one is a clip of uh, Jeff Bizanson, whom most of you in the audience will probably know. But if you don't, he is the sort of primary person behind the Julia type system and one of the original founders of Julia and you know, one, of the, one of the greats of the Julia community. And this, this video clip is at uh, Boston Airport on our way to, uh, uh, to Chicago for the first ever Julia Khan. So. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm recording. Why? I'm making a trip documentary. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to say something to the camera? This is this is my worst nightmare. <laughs> this is this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I was I was enjoying myself and, until now. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take over from here. Uh, we're gonna move to our interviews now. Thank you, Kenna, for that awesome video. Uh, and uh, uh, if we still have Valentin here, which it looks like we do, um, we're going to pull up Valentin before he has to go to sleep. It is getting late in Germany. Um, yes, but thanks I'm so much. actually in Europe. Yes, uh, you know what time Maybe it is, uh, though. We don't, right, well, if only we were all in Europe together. Um, 
but um, what time are the what time does the workshop start for you in Germany time? I actually don't know, but if you say 10 a.m. Eastern, it's going to be 4 p.m. Uh, Central European. I think that's right. That's what uh, Mose said as well. Yes, good. Um, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, this is our, our podcast, and we do interviews. Um, and um, we wanted to just talk to you about um, your work with Julia, um, your work at the Julia Lab at MIT, and uh, maybe maybe you can share the story about how you got involved with Julia, all of the above. So why don't we start with, um, yeah, what, can you tell us a story about how you got involved with Julia? It's a nice story. Well, there, I think there are two stories there. The first story is how I got started with Julia was um, during an internship at Indiana University, I think in... 2015, January 2015, I like ported some MATLAB code to Julia and was like, oh my God, it's fast. And it's not MATLAB. So that was big plus, it was not MATLAB, it was much faster and my collaborators could still understand it. Um, and I started porting this relatively involved code um, to Julia and we needed to make it fast and we started uh, to do, wanting to do GPU acceleration. Um, and so at the time I had a very strong strength and I wanted, uh, didn't want to use NVIDIA's um, CUDA, so I used OpenCL. And so I got involved with OpenCL.gl, which was written by Jake Bolesky, which actually he was on a, one of the photo, uh, the video that uh, you just showed, he was in the background there. Um, and I started maintaining OpenCL.gl for my own needs and that was really the first proper open source um, contribution I made and then maintenance um, I took over um, and it's probably also some of the oldest uh, code I've written that people still use to this day um, and uh, yeah so I, I stayed um, I at, the, at that point I was doing a bachelor's of science in cognitive um, science and um, I was doing all my research, starting to do all my research in Julia all the time. I, before that, I did my research in Scala, which was a questionable choice of mine. Um, and uh, as time went on, I like got more and more involved. And um, I think about a year later, um, Tim Bissart uh, released um, a, a an email to the mailing list where he was like, I, I've, I've written a compiler from, for Julia uh, to CUDA. Um, and it's, it's this big thing, but I don't have time to finish it. Um, and I should really get on with my PhD and do some, uh, like, I need to do something else. And so I started poking at that and like trying to get it so that I, because I wanted to do a GPU code generation um, straight from Julia because I was working on big machine learning pipelines and I was using MXNet at the time uh, and maintaining the MX, MXNet Julia bindings. And so I wanted to experiment, build upon uh, what we had, and um, well, I didn't want to write C++. It's like, we, we wanted to customize a single thing in MXNet, it took us six months, because uh, getting like into the beats and the SNA drive uh, took us five attempts. Um, and so I started talking at that, and at some point, Viral Shah uh, contacted me and was like, you seem to be interested in this GPU thing, I, I, that, that might, might be important in the future. Uh, would you mind coming out to MIT for like an internship um, and working in the Julia lab? And I was like, sure, but we really should get the guy who actually knows what, who, what he's doing, uh, which is Tim Bizarre. Um And so they invited both of us over and we spent the summer of 2016 um, at MIT working on the GPU compiler and getting it to the stage where it was actually publicly usable. Um, and then at the end of that, um, and Edelman asked me what I was doing with my life, and I was like, well, I'm, I'm working on honeybees. Um, and he was like, well, you should work on Julia. Um, and uh, a year and a half later, I, I switched uh, my PhD program to MIT. We're really glad to have you. I'm, I'm glad that you came over and uh, uh, switched to be full-time working on Julia. That's awesome. So now you're at Julia in, Al in Alan's lab um, at MIT. Um, and uh, we're going to talk to Chris later, who, who's also there. And David also has spent some time there. It's a nice lab. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, what, um, what is your day-to-day -day, uh, life at the MIT Julia lab? And what are you researching there? So my research topic uh, is 
this to be the title genius computing. Whatever that means, I will figure it out eventually. Um, basically, I, I try to get Julia running on big clusters and uh, make it work for HPC applications. Um, and my day to day HPC? work uh, HPC, high performance H computing. Yep. Um, and so my day to day work, um, I always joke that it's 30% consulting, 30% um, community work, and 30% researching. Um, and so uh, right now I'm involved uh, with a couple of uh, projects and the biggest one of that is the climate machine um, collaboration, which is building a next generation climate model um, all in Julia using the Julia GPU stack. That's really inspiring. Um, can you talk a little bit more about Clima? It's a really awesome effort. Uh, so so Clima came about uh, mostly, I think there's, there's some very strong uh, science reasons for why they want to rewrite um, a climate model, they want to write a climate model from scratch, and they want to get rid of, uh, do some, some enhancements to how climate science is done by going back to first principles and deriving from other things. But they also want to integrate machine learning um, and data simulation to tuning um, the climate model itself. Uh, but they had a lot of people with, with many years of experience between them in writing climate models. And so, for example, like the folks who wrote MIT GCM, which is a gigantic Fortin um, code um, at MIT, a part of the collaboration and but they had realized that their problem was that they were no longer getting uh, young researchers excited um, about joining the project because they were like wait we have to work with Fortran 77 code um, it's not that bad Fortran is a nice language um, but so they, they look it's not at, commonly at taught yeah Yes, it's not, it's not, in physics it's very, still very common, but like outside of physics, physics it isn't. Um, and so they came to us and were like, is Julia capable of um, being more readable, more elegant, more closer to the mathematics, um, while also being as fast as Fortran? And so at the time, Peter Adams, uh, Sang Wu and I uh, did a sprint a couple of weeks of like doing some fluid modeling for the first time, like we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, we had some guidance from them and we showed what, how we would write the code. Um, and then we threw that away and started from scratch and actually built a functioning climate model. Um, but yeah, maybe we convinced them that the Julia was a sensible uh, uh, way to go. And uh, we've been working with them ever since to make sure that like the sharp edges uh, get ironed out that they are encountering. Awesome. Now yeah, we're glad to have you doing that. I mean, the all of everybody benefits from this kind of work so that's really nice uh, and it's nice that julia could could be useful for making these kinds of projects go faster and easier yeah um okay cool what um that's that's everything that i think i really wanted to cover with you i have some other just kind of silly fun questions um what editor do you use when you write julia i know you oh, have strong feelings on this uh i i use I use anything that will give me VI bindings, um, but I switch to Visual Studio Code mostly um, just because the remote editing capabilities. And I, I use the uh, Julia um, uh, extension there, but only for the syntax highlighting. I, I, I still don't know these features. Like David Sanders at some point asked me, how, to, uh, how do I do this? And I'm like, why do you want to do that? You just run the code in a terminal and that's the thing you wanted it to do. Um, so yeah, a terminal, a, a Vim editor, and if I want to work remotely, um, Visual Studio Code. Yeah. The, Valentin introduced me to the Visual Studio Co VS Code's um, remote editing uh, abilities. We, we've worked together a little bit from uh, my home here in Providence and his home an hour away in Boston. And it is actually really amazing. If none of if you if, if any of you ever have to do any remote collaboration, um, it's like a it's a really nice experience. Highly yeah. recommend. And if you don't like fancy um, editors, I would recommend Teammate for that. Yeah, Teammate's also nice. Yep, agreed. Okay, and then um, the other fun question I uh, wanted to ask was, um, uh, well, actually, I take okay. The other question I wanted to ask was, uh, what part of the Julia ecosystem would you love to see get more contribution? If you if you could pick uh, if you could like wave a magic wand and get more people uh, who are maybe listening 
and looking for somewhere to, to contribute? Um, we always need more compiler people or if people interested in compiler work because it is such a diverse area and there are so many open questions and interesting questions, but it's also a, an area where you need quite a bit of uh, guidance uh, before, you, before you can become effective. Um, so in reality, I think distributed.gl, the distributed stack in its entirely, there's some really sharp uh, usability edges right now that I don't really experience anymore because I trained myself to avoid them. Um, and I think we, we need somebody with fresh eyes to look at it and be like, well, how do we make the user experience better here? Thanks. So uh, if anybody's looking for something, those, those are both great suggestions. Okay, um, uh, last I wanted to ask, um, uh, I think you've been involved with uh, organizing for JuliaCon. Um, uh, what, what's that been like? And um, Well, anything it, to... it's, been a, it's been an interesting ride. I think this JuliaCon is the first since, 2000, so my first JuliaCon was 2016 as a participant. And then every year since then, I've been involved in some parts in the organizational efforts, uh, I think in, uh, 2017 in Berkeley, I did a lot of work together with um, Andreas. Um, and then the years after, um, I was, um, I did three submissions before Chris took them over. And for the last two years, I've been doing the JuliaCon proceedings. Organizing has been a ton of fun and like, especially working with people um, who are excited about it. Um, it's also a lot of work. So the more people you have uh, have uh, working with you, the easier you can spread the load around. Um, I honestly, I think last year I did go to any JuliaCon talk and I just like stood in the hallway talking to people and being excited. And I do not have any memories from JuliaCon London because, uh, or the only memory I have is at the end of it, uh, laying outside my accommodation, giggling for half an hour because I uh, <laughs> was like, it's done. But it's been one of the most fun and rewarding activities I've, I've been doing. Um, proceedings has been stressful just because there's a whole lot new things to learn and to uh, figure out. And as you might have noticed, we haven't published them yet. And so I hope that before the conference goes live, we have the first paper from last year officially published and uh, deposited. And if we get that done, then I can... With, uh, with good conscious announced that we will do proceedings for this year as well. Awesome. We're looking forward to that. Thanks for everything you've been doing on that. I know it's been a lot of work. Thank you for having me. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Valentin. Uh, and also want to plug Valentin's point. Uh, if anybody listening is enjoying JulieCon so much, we're always looking for more volunteers for the organizing committee. Um, several of us on this call have been involved with it in some capacity in the past, and it is a lot of fun. Um, so I uh, would love to get you involved uh, and you'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll see an information about that coming from the Julia Khan uh, email about how to get involved with the organizing committee. So we'd love to have you. Okay. Thanks, Valentin. I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. You too. Good night. Bye. Sleep well. Don't stay up too late. Agreed. All right. Um, I think next up we'll have uh, Jacob Quinn. So Jacob, are you still on the call? And I am. Yep. Capable of talking. Perfect. All right. Uh, so Jacob, uh, obviously you've been a, a long time contributor to Julia and the data ecosystem and uh, chief maintainership of HTTP.jl, um, which obviously has been critical as people are doing more and more general purpose things with Julia. I think every other project I look at now has some sort of dependency on HTTP.jl. So I, I need to look at it not infrequently, but uh, tell us how you got started and what got you into Julia and uh, your story. So back in 2012, I was doing um, data analyst work. So um, analyzing data, we were, I was working for uh, Sears, which is a big box store, retail store in the United States. Um, not as, common or popular anymore, but um, doing some analytics on just sales data. And we were starting to get into some bigger data, not huge, but 
um, several million rows worth of data. I think the biggest we got was up to like 30 million rows worth of data. And trying to run analysis on stuff in R. And um, the, the problem I kept running into was you had to vectorize the code just right or you just got toasted. Um, if you didn't like do just the right trick or the right something apply function, then you know your code just took hours and hours and hours to run. Um, and and I never even thought about writing my own function. It was all you know googling vectorize this or vectorize that, and how do I do this, and then just using kind of whatever else you know people had out there. So uh, it was a little rough and. We just kept running into these issues. I remember I had one calculation that um, I finally got working, but it took 18 hours to run. <laughs> and it was only like 30 million rows of data, but I would set up my laptop and just like let it run like all day long. And then by the end, it was like done. Um, but it was around that same time we were, I was doing that exact analysis um, that I saw on like TechCrunch or something. It was like, oh, Julia Lang, 0.0, .0 like first made public. Uh, it's going to take over the world. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, I'm interested in programming languages a little bit and tech. And so I read an article about it and they're like, oh yeah, the GitHub is public now and you can go download it and use it. And uh, unfortunately I was on Windows. And so it, I think it just barely actually started <laughs> when it first started on Windows. And I think Keno actually put together that like, actually yeah, getting it yeah, to work. No, they, the, first, the very first release of Julia did not work on Windows. It took about six, seven months for us to do the port. And then we merged it, we merged it in January of 2013, Yeah, I think. And so you could, yeah, you could get some pieces working, but there was like big chunks that was like, no, yeah, that's not going to work. Um, but I remember I was able to at least read in like a big CSV file somehow. I don't remember what code there was then, but uh, I think I read it into a matrix. And then I was like, okay, how do I do, how do I like, translate this calculation I was doing into Julia from R? So I was like, okay. And it was like, oh yeah, just write a function. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like <laughs> write my own function? I don't know, that's, that's scary. Um, but I was like, okay, let's dive in. So I read through the manual over a weekend. I learned about types and functions and all this stuff. And then I did, I wrote, I ported my code over and I, it literally was just doing like a map of a function over like all these rows and calculating kind of some like moving averages and stuff like that. I can't remember exactly, but uh, I remember when I first ran it, it ran in literally like 30 seconds. <laughs> and I was like, wait, is this real? Like, is this right? Uh, something's wrong. I'm doing something wrong, but no, it was literally like uh, just fast. And so that was kind of the initial hook for me. And from there it was like, okay, I got to move all my stuff over to Julia. So I had been running all of these scripts that would pull data from various places and do munging and cleaning and ETL and all of this stuff. And then um, output Excel files and all this stuff. And so uh, that was kind of where I kicked off a lot of my work in data ecosystem. So the first package I wrote was odbc.jl because um, I just needed something that uh, I could connect the databases with. There was a few different databases we had data in and I needed to pull the data out. And so that was my first foray into building a package. Um, worked a little bit on data frames early on um, and then started working on CSV a lot just because we had lots of CSV data. Um, so that's kind of where I just kind of got started and doing a lot of the, you know, data formats and uh, database packages and that kind of stuff. And it's just kind of snowballed since then. <laughs> so that's how I got started. Yeah. No, I'm, I, you know, I'm always amazed that people got any sort of performance out of Julia uh, back in like 2012, 2013 because there was just so many things that we now think of as critical to Julia performance, immutables, tuples, like sound type system, mostly sound, <laughs> yeah. uh, like optimizations, like all of that was just not there yeah. in, in 2012, right? But I, you know, I, I think it, it speaks to what people wanted out of the language, which was, yeah, 
being able to get performance. And even if things were still broken, as you said, I think people people were able to see the promise. But I, I did want to uh, circle back on the performance because one of the things that I didn't mention is your your epic quest to uh, build the fastest CSV reader in the world. So why <laughs> why don't you why don't you tell us some of the you know stories in the trenches of how do you get CSVs to to be fast? Oh well, let's see. Yeah, that's it's kind of been a long journey because it's gone through a couple different big iterations. Because um, I kind of wrote an initial one that was at least faster than base uh, the delimited file standard lib. Because I was like, ah, that's so slow. And I know it's doing all these things. We could be way faster than that. And so I wrote the initial version of CSV just because I wanted it to be faster than what was in Bayes. And I thought I was going to like just replace it immediately. But it ended up being a little messier than I thought and had a lot more like other package dependencies. And so it never got into port to base uh, state. Um, but yeah, so that was the initial version. And then, um, you know, it's just kind of that constant nagging thought and, and people saying, well, you know, I ran it in this other language and it was way faster. And it's like, ah, oh, okay. Yeah, we could probably be faster. Um, so yeah, it's kind of gone through a couple different iterations and it's actually really evolved as Julia's evolved, I found, because with some of these bigger features that have come out in Julia, um, I feel like it's been like, oh yeah, we could totally leverage that in how we parse CSVs. Um, and and I'll, I'll point out one of the key um, uh, issues that we run into is, because um, when, you're, when you're parsing a CSV file, you have to parse it row by row, but then within a row, it's column by column. And each column is, going to have one of you know eight types or so so it's string int float date date time time you know maybe a couple others we can support but they're it's a pretty like fixed set of types that you're you're worried about um and it the initial version of csv actually compiled it would detect the type it tried to do this like fancy type detection on a sampling of the file and then it actually generated like a custom inner loop that would say for this fixed set of you know types that we are expecting, let's unroll that loop and so that we're parsing each type individually. And that had the advantage of being really fast, but the compile times were just awful. So each new file basically had to recompile all of this stuff in CSV and that ended up being really slow. So the second time you read a CSV file, it was always really fast, but the first time you always had to pay this compilation cost. Um, and so then, the next big iteration, this was about a year, year and a half ago, was, oh, hey, what if we kind of did our own pseudo little type system in CSV? Because we know we're only dealing with these like eight fixed types um, and just stored everything as a UN64. OK, sweet. So each column was a vector of UN64s. Um, I could store every other type in that. So an int could be an int64 or float. We'll just bit cast it. If it's a date or a date time, those are internally stored as int64, so we could bit cast those. Um, and then a string, we did this representation where it was a string represented a uint64, where the first, I think, 16 bits were for the length, the other 40 bits were for uh, you know, the byte position within the file. And so then as long as you kept the file byte buffer around, you could just basically lazily index into the file for your strings. And so that's how we were parsing the CSVs. And that was great because now we had a type stable, no need to recompile inner function loop for these CSVs. And um, it was really fast as well. So that was cool. The only disadvantage was what you got out of it was kind of these custom wrapped uh, vector types. So it was CSV column. Um, and for most of the types, we could have supported mutability, like set index and stuff. But um, the problem with strings is like these were these lazily indexed strings. And so trying to figure out this vector type that could like lazily index the string, but then you could like mutate it, like it just got really messy. And so it was like, okay, well, these are only read only immutable vectors. And the only problem with that is then all these people were saying, oh, you know, I always read the CSV file in and then I need to mutate stuff or filter or uh, push additional rows onto it or all this stuff. And so they would have to copy 
they would have to basically materialize from this read-only vector into a full vector anyway. And so then it was like, okay, at the end of the day, we need mutable vectors. And so that's what the latest push, uh, I just released the 0 0.7 release within the last month or so. Um, that's what that release was aimed at was, okay, how can we do the same, get the same kind of type stable, no need to recompile the inner loop, but also produce fully mutable vectors. And so that was uh, actually a fun week of staying up till like two or 3 a.m. each night. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, musicals. So I would put on like two or three musicals a night and uh, watch them while thinking through these crazy, you know, solutions to how we could achieve this. But um, a tip from Tim Holy, you know, we always have to like hat tip him, I think in every Julia conversation, right? Because he is kind of the master purveyor of tips in Julia. Um, he pointed out, because I at one point I said, man, if I could only like give myself an array of like all these union types, like, cause I could say um, my, I could have a vector of columns and it could just be this big union of all each of the different vector types that I had. And then Julia has this ability where it'll automatically unroll up to four union types and generate, you know, really fast code for you. Cause that's essentially what I was doing in my, you know, UN64 pseudo type system was, you know, if the column is a one, then it's a int. If it's a two, it's a float. If it's a three, it's a string. Um, and then he pointed out like, hey, you can actually do that because um, if you pull something out of a untyped container, like in any array, then you just can um, compare it against a concrete type. And then the code generated for that branch will be uh, type stable and concrete. And I, was the revelation I needed for saying, oh, you're welcome, okay, by the we way. Can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's how we can achieve. Um, we just create regular vectors now. Um, you get fully mutable. And then the other big uh, you know, thing that we've added to CSV is the multi threaded parsing. So with Julia 1.3 landing, uh, I kind of dove into the multi threading code. CSV is kind of fun because. Uh, you just kind of chunk up the file into big chunks. And as long as you can find where the rows end, start and end, then you can say, okay, each thread go tackle a chunk of the file. Mm -hmm. And then um, we just do kind of a lazy concat of all the chunks at the end to say, here are your chunked, you know, columns of your CSV file. So um, it ends up being really, really yeah. fast. So there's some, there's been a lot of cool benchmarks lately where it just shows that yeah. CSV kind of smokes everybody and, yeah, that's kind of fun. Yeah, so that that went uh, went viral, and I think towards data science was it maybe the CSV shootout. Yeah, uh, we are basically so out of time, but I did want to got a lot faster since then too with the latest release. So well, you should redo the benchmark and go <laughs> viral again. I mean, there's there's never anything wrong with like publishing a benchmark where you're fast, because even if you could go faster, you can always just publish it again and uh, go viral again. So we are basically we are basically out of time. Uh, but I did want to give you an opportunity for you know just a minute to plug your workshop, which was this morning. We previewed it on the episode that came out yesterday, but I figured now that it's done, you know, you should just give us the thirty-second summary of what happened, <laughs> such that all the viewers that are here but weren't there can go watch it. Yeah, if you want to listen to me talk for like almost four hours straight, you should go watch it. <laughs> no, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was building microservices in Julia, so. Um, I think Julia is a great language for building microservices, um, which are kind of standalone, uh, you know, programs that can run on a server somewhere. You can um, hit them through APIs and interfaces. And uh, we just kind of walked through very in detail, step by step, how you could build a microservice in Julia. How, um, a lot of the packages that are in the Julia ecosystem that can help with that. So HTTP. Um, tables and strapping and some of the database packages. Um, also like the JWT for authentication. So there's a lot of those things that exist in the Julia ecosystem. It's just, um, you know, I've kind of seen there's a need to have, you know, examples, big extended examples where we kind of bring everything together and show how composable and they, how everything can work together. So that was kind of the goal with the workshop. And so far the feedback has been pretty positive that, you know, people have really enjoyed just seeing all of that come together and building something really like literally from scratch. So great. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Jacob, for coming on. And thanks for doing it on short order. I think we messaged you like three hours before recording this, just after your workshop ended. So 
we, yeah. we, we doubly appreciate you, you know, tacking on another 15 minutes to your four hours of talking today. Hashtag quarantine uh, life. That's all I say. Right. <laughs> to speak to our viewers. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you again. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll take it from here. Hi, David. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, your video is not on. Yeah. Is, okay, it, great. Uh, is it on now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's on Hi. now. So how are you, David? Um, I know you gave a workshop yesterday as well. Right. Uh, I gave a workshop yesterday on uh, learning, let's say, intermediate level Julia skills with uh, via sort of in the context of epidemic modeling, which is, you know, kind of everybody is uh, worried about that right now, of course. Yeah. So how is, I mean, I know that uh, I think my very first uh, Julia workshop class tutorial I watched on YouTube was actually your video uh, okay. back in like I think 2014 <laughs> or 2015. So I know you've done a lot of these uh, videos and tutorials on, uh, you have a lot of content online about uh, teaching Julia. So um, maybe why don't you tell us, like take us back a few years um, oh. since like you started doing uh, this type of work and mm -hmm. how you got into Julia and how you got into doing this type of work. Okay, so yes, I'm a professor at the National University of Mexico, UNAM. Uh, in Mexico City, where I've been working since 2008. And um, I basically sort of started specializing in, uh, I mean, apart from my research in teaching computational science in, in a, you know, where, and there wasn't much of that going on at the time. And I um, had become a big fan of Python, actually. Uh, and so I started, uh -oh. introduced <laughs> Python, yeah, sorry. I introduced <laughs> Python into, you know, the curriculum and um, I started teaching a lot of Python courses of all kinds. And so I ended up <clears throat> at SciPy, the Scientific Python Conference in 2013. And there I discovered that the, it was a great community, just like the Julia community is. And um, I really enjoyed it. And I met you know, a lot of people that um, are important in, in that, that world, like Fernando Perez, who developed the Jupyter project, which was then called IPython. And so I actually think I basically found out about IPython, now Jupyter, for the first time in 2013 at SciPy, and a lot of other things as well. And um, I fell in love with it immediately, of course, for, because for teaching, it's just so, it's, it's so nice in many ways to have just one place where you can combine you know, code and text and equations and figures in one place. And at that conference, Jeff and Stefan gave a talk on Julia. A 20 minute talk, which was supposed to, which I believe was a continuation of a talk they had given the previous year that I, when I hadn't been at the meeting. And I went to the talk and I had, I have to say, I did not understand, you know, why Julia was interesting. It just looked like sort of, it looked pretty similar to Python. I, I didn't, didn't get it. Um, so I kind of forgot about it. You know, I, I guess I registered it in the back of my mind and then forgot about it again. But then the same year I went to a, I started uh, rewriting the documentation for Jupyter, some of the documentation. Uh, I was very into it. And so I went to the Jupyter, the IPython developers meeting when they were just about, I think, to release version 1.0. And Jeff, Stefan, and Stephen Johnson went to that meeting in order to write the first non-Python kernel for Jupyter. And so I met, met them, in particular, one lunchtime, I was talking to Jeff uh, for about an hour over lunch and he convinced me, you know, and I said, basically, I think I literally said to him, so tell me why is Julia interesting? And so he spent an hour trying to convince me why it was interesting and it definitely piqued my curiosity. And so um, when I got back home, so that was in the summer of 2013, I got back home and you know, again, you know, life happened. But then I asked one of my students at the time to look into Julia and so he gave, a, gave us a kind of presentation you know, about Julia, and I still didn't get it. I still didn't get it. Uh, so then around that time, a colleague of mine, Luis Bennett at UNAM, uh, suggested that we start learning about interval arithmetic. So this is a, a really cool technique which enables you to do calculations with sets instead of with, with, re with floating point numbers. You do calculations with complete sets of real numbers using floating point arithmetic. And it gives you a way to actually uh, 
make your calculations rigorous and guaranteed. So I'm actually going to be doing an, another workshop about this uh, on Monday. So please feel free to, to join. It's a very cool subject. And Julia, of course, is the perfect language to write the software in to do interval arithmetic. And so we started writing this, this stuff in Python, and it was just really painful. But of course, we didn't really know that it was painful at the time until Luis, around the start of 2014, if I'm not mistaken, sat down and tried to do it in Julia and just said, you know, he immediately told me, you, you have to try this. It's so, you know, it's just so natural to write it in Julia. And um, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so then I started using Julia and I immediately, of course, thought, wow, this is just fantastic. So at the time I was using Python and C++, you know, this typical two language problem, two language situation, and I just basically stopped using them, you know, pretty soon afterwards, I think. And I actually, I believe, yes, yeah, so I think the first time I, yeah, so then I proposed a workshop at SciPy 2014. So I did one on Python and I did one on Julia. So I proposed this workshop and it turns out that they had actually, the SciPy organizers had actually approached Jeff and Stefan to give a tutorial at that SciPy meeting and they were not able to, you know, due to some other commitment. And so I randomly sort of independently proposed this tutorial and, and that was the first tutorial I gave on Julia. Basically, the idea being to actually convince myself, to force myself to sit down and learn Julia and then sit down and explain it to somebody. That was the reason that I, decided to give this tutorial to, to force myself to really learn it properly. And you know, that, that was also the reason that we started teaching interval arithmetic and got into interval arithmetic. So the best way to learn something is to teach it. You know, definitely not necessarily good for the students in your, in your class, but it really makes you uh, learn it uh, very, very, very fully. Anyway, so, <clears throat> and then I started, I think I even, in the second half of 2014, just after my workshop at SciPy, I think I started teaching my first course with Julia at UNAM. The poor student, you know, it was just before version 0 0.3 was released. I mean, it, it was a horrific nightmare to install, you know, things at the time. And I think the students really suffered. And I apologize to anybody out there who took that course. Although, you know, I think some people did see the, the beauty behind the, the pain as well. And well, so I've been using Julia since then. And uh, as I said, I've been uh, developing these, this package, these packages that I'm going to talk about. We've rewritten those a few times as we've learned Julia and Julia has evolved itself. So yeah, and I've, I've been giving tutorials ever since and in various countries around the world as well and at many of the Julia con, cons in the past. That's an amazing story. I do have to ask, actually, Mose, I think, asked that question on the um, Julia uh, live stream. He asked, uh -huh. uh, what did Jeff say to convince you on that one hour of... Uh, yeah, like, I don't really yeah. remember. I, I, guess he, I guess the point was, uh, you know, the two language problem and, and, and uh, performance. I guess it, it was about that and, you know, trying to explain to me why it was possible to get performance, which is, you know, still difficult to explain to people, actually why Julia is able to get such good performance when you write code that looks so similar to Python, right? Whereas Python is, I mean, is 50 it, times it, slower or 30 times slower for certain kinds of calculations. The kinds that I, I actually usually do, actually, is exactly the kind of thing that Python is very bad at doing, which is why I had to use C++ for the, you know, the, the efficiency and use Python for, for all the sort of plotting and data munging, basically. I mean, I, I think this is very interesting in general because uh, I think a lot of people go through that pipeline as well, like thinking like Python is already there, like I'm used to that pipeline, uh, why switch to a new thing now? Right. Uh, so I think it's it's really interesting to hear um, you coming from, from that kind of way of thinking to uh, finally switch to Julia. But it, it no, feels it was, like it, the turning point really was when you wanted to do this um, project yeah. with, with Louise, right? Right, right. When we started just realizing that it was so much more natural and sort of the code was so much cleaner and more readable, more writable in Julia. And it was 
Well, okay, so at that time, we weren't really worrying about efficiency, right? Because the point about interval arithmetic is to get these kind of guarantees that the result is correct. And in some sense, if you if you want a guarantee, maybe you don't necessarily care so much about performance. But actually, of course, then it turns out that you do care about performance. And that's what we've been focusing on the last couple of years. But uh, at the time, we weren't into the performance aspect. But it was just so much easier to write the code and get stuff done and you know read the code again. And um, you know, Python was, was just... Uh, not not doing it for us at the time. All right, I have a follow up question to you about that because with our two previous uh, with uh, Valentin and Jacob, uh, and a lot of people I talk to in the Julia community, it always seems like they did this one thing in Julia and it was a hook, and like they were hooked ever since, and it was like super quick. And with you, it seems like there was a process, there was a convincing <laughs> process that went on. So my question is, That's how do you right now convince people to switch to Julia? That's a good question. Yeah, I, I find it difficult to convince them. I mean, uh, still, wow. you know, despite having, yeah, because it, it is still, you know, and but, but it wasn't, you see, it wasn't really until I sat down and did it myself on something that I actually cared about and that, where I had a, this comparison that I actually, realize what was was going on when you just see somebody doing it it you don't really get it necessarily you have to actually you know yes yeah, so the first thing i did i guess I, yeah i do remember but i do remember say uh, the first one of the first things i did i think was take a code that simulated the dynamics of some random walks which is what i was doing in my tutorial yesterday and i translated that into julia which basically consisted of you know, removing some colons from the end of a for loop in Python and adding an end instead. And basically that made the Python code into Julia code pretty much. And I must have, yeah, I guess it was at the, at the time it wasn't so easy to benchmark carefully. So maybe, but maybe I did benchmark. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty hazy on that. But, but what, yeah, once, once I started really sort of getting it, yeah, you have to. Yeah, there's some. There's definitely some energy barrier to get over, right? You you know, say Python or MATLAB so well, and then you you're confronted with this new weird thing. You don't understand how to use it. Everything you do is sort of broke. It seems to be broken. And nothing feels natural. So there's definitely an energy barrier. That's the hard thing to get people over. Even if you show yeah. them, look, it's it's so fast, or look, it's so beautiful. It they will feel that it's hard to sit down and write it themselves. So I guess no, that's I one of the reasons. I would say that that energy barrier has been going, like, um, decreasing over Yeah, I years. think that's right. Yeah, especially, you yeah. know, you, it used to be so hard. You know, but my students still complain, but there's no tutorial materials on Julia, even though you know, there's no way to, you, you can't search Stack Overflow or whatever, which is still partially true. But of course, there are, there's a lot more available now. But I think that's one of the reasons that I've been doing all these workshops is, well, yeah. So I mean, I, I liked the 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 the, the, the style of workshop at Julia Con where you're supposed to have a lot of exercises for people to do because that's the way to actually get them to sit down and and work out what's going on, and then you're you're right there to say, oh, well, you did it that way, but you could have done it this way. And of course, that's much easier to do in person, but I hope it worked online as well to some extent. Yeah. I mean, thanks for actually making all these tutorials and all of this material accessible for a lot of people. I, I know that a lot of people actually take your uh, tutorials or your notebooks that are on your GitHub um, page. Uh, so yeah, thanks for actually creating all of that oh, material. Um, uh, before yeah. I let you go, I'll ask you uh, just like a random question. I know you mentioned IPython slash, or um, that's changed its name to Jupyter now. Uh, what is that your favorite editor? That's how oh, that's that's how a, you write your code. That's a good question. So yeah, I, I I think that was that was you know for doing kind of scientific explorations, it's it's pretty good. But for actually writing code, not necessarily so much, right? So I used to use Atom actually, the Atom editor. I've been using Atom for a, a long time until just recently, when basically it seems that unfortunately that effort is sort of coming to an end. And so I actually have started uh, using VS Code now as well. And- um, Cool, more and, thoughts to VS Code. <laughs> I mean, just that seems to be the option. And uh, there's this great new package, Pluto.jl, that uh, Fonz van der Plas has been writing. It's just amazing. And I highly recommend that people start using it. I, I you know, It's difficult to make the switch again because I'm so used to the Jupyter 
uh, keyboard shortcuts to, uh, so I just feel sort of comfortable in that environment. And then you move to this new environment and everything's a bit different and the keyboard shortcuts don't work. And, and uh, so that's, you know, that's the reason I haven't made the, the taken the plunge yet, but I think it's really uh, a fantastic project. And I'm that's amazing. Uh, we're running out of time, David, but thank you so much for being with us today. I know you're giving thank another you workshop uh, on Monday. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Uh, 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. What did, did we figure out the other timing? 2 p.m. Um, UTC, 3 p.m. UK. 2 p.m. UTC, 4 p.m. European. UK. Uh, just go to the website. <laughs> Um, okay, thanks, David, for being with us. Uh, thanks to well, everyone for the um, David and Jacob and Valentin for joining us for the interviews. And now we'll actually move to our last uh, segment for today's episode. Uh, thanks, David. Thanks. Hi, David. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, back to me. So for the first half of our last segment, we're going to do some news from Julia Khan and the uh, uh, the wider Julia world. So uh, in JuliaCon news, um, I think we have crossed 7,000 registered attendees, which is insane because last year we had you know 500 in-person attendees. So going uh, going up, with just you know a factor of 14. It's going to be quite a different conference. So I'm looking forward to see how it works out. I have absolutely no idea um, what to expect. But I think it should be kind of fun. Um, and yeah, a few other stats. I think the uh, tutorial that uh, David gave uh, yesterday has already 4,000 views on YouTube. So at least some percentage of those 7,000 attendees are actually, um, are actually watching. And uh, I think in the live, uh, each of the workshops have over a few hundred people who are there live in the actual Zoom, uh, in addition to people just you know casually watching it on YouTube. So if you don't know and you're listening, uh, the workshops are interactive. So it's supposed to be emulate the in-person experience. So they're not just YouTube things. And if you are signed up for the conference, uh, you will get or should have gotten an email that gives you Zoom links and passwords for uh, each of the workshops. So uh, the workshops are interactive and you can participate. So if you're actually planning to you know, go along and participate and want to ask questions, uh, find those Zoom links, uh, join the workshops, and, and take advantage of that. And I think people have been. I think there are a few hundred people have been. Nathan, did you want to add something? still can at juliacon.org. Yes. And then you can get those links. So if you're planning to attend a workshop, please do sign up at juliacon.org. Absolutely. Continue. Uh, and if you're watching this, you know, sign up and subscribe and hit all the buttons. I don't know how YouTube works. You know, R ring the bell is not what the YouTube will say. Uh, oh, yeah, Huda will tell you more about YouTube later, I guess. Anyway, um, uh, so that's the uh, news from Julia Khan. I imagine we'll have more news as the conference goes along. So we're planning to uh, make this a recurring segment. If you have news from Julia Khan that you would like us to cover, put in the forum that we'll again plug in a little bit. Um, I think other news, there's a Discord server. So you should join that. If you don't know where it is, again, register. You should have gotten an email. I think there's a Minecraft server now. Um, there's lots of things. But if you know of something that we didn't cover that you would like us to cover, tell us, and we'll cover it. Uh, all right. I think that's it for JuliaCon news. Uh, in more general Julia news, one of the feedback items that we got on the survey was that people would like us to cover technical news for Julia itself during the conference also. Uh, of course, ironically, during JuliaCon is mostly not a lot of actual Julia work happening. It's sort of very clear on graphs of like how much Julia work is happening every year, JuliaCon, just, sorry, everybody's taking a week off. Um, but, oops, I almost dropped my phone. Uh, uh, but uh, we do have a bit of technical news, which is that uh, the Julia 1.5 RC2, uh, I think all the issues have been resolved as of yesterday. And I think uh, Jeff pushed the latest backport PR about five hours ago. Uh, so that should be coming out uh, hopefully this weekend. So uh, Julia 1.5. 
Woo! That's exciting. Woo -hoo. All right. Um, and with that, uh, we will go to our say hi segment where members of the audience who don't want to be interviewed, but who just want to say hi, come on for 30 seconds to a minute. And we had a lot of requests, but since we had a fully packed episode, we only decided to do one today. And our one person in the say hi segment today is uh, Chris Rokakis. So Chris Rokakis, yep. hello. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, actually, I want to give on, come on to actually plug some one of our projects. So, um, with the MIT Lincoln Lab, uh, we're launching this new thing. So, um, essentially, GPS can be you can jam GPS quite easily, right? So, anyone who's taken MIT EE classes can you know build a little thing that will you know make it so that way no one can navigate. It is possible to be able to navigate with just the Earth's magnetic field, um, and so we have data available to, for you to be able to do scientific machine learning. So, there's starter code with data for in a Julia repository where you can just kind of jump in, uh, try to get a publication in something that is cool new aerospace ML kind of problem, um, and it's all Julia code to get you there. So, hopefully. You guys are all excited and it sounds fun. <laughs> all right. Hi, Chris. Just for everybody, what is yeah, what is hello. what is your name and, and who are you? That's oh I'm Chris Rakakis. Um oh, I've Chris used Rikakis. Julia before, yeah. You have used Julia before. All right. I think uh, we may have Chris on for a more extended interview in a in a future episode. I know your name was requested, but uh, all right. Bye Chris. Uh, thanks for, yeah, thanks bye -bye. for stopping <laughs> by. Bye Chris. Uh, and again, if, if you want to come on for just our 30-second uh, to a minute say hi segment, uh, you can by just leaving your email in the, in the forum. And with that, Huda, why don't you uh, tell the people news about the podcast itself and then uh, wrap us up. I think it's been a, a long hour. Yeah. I just have to say, we're doing pretty good. Like, it's good timing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, ending the today's episode, uh, there are a couple things we wanted to tell you. First of all, uh, when we released the uh, uh, first episode, it was more of a um, personal effort and we just thought we're just put it online and uh, whatever. Uh, but apparently there was uh, people asked uh, that we move um, all the episodes to the Julia language channel. Uh, so what we are going to do is keep the live session on our own uh, Julia, uh, the podcast, Julia Khan, the podcast uh, YouTube channel, because as you can see, it's not super uh, perfectly organized and professional just yet. So like, we don't want to pay 25,000 people when we go live. <laughs> uh, so there's that. But if you are able to bear with us uh, for the first couple of episodes, uh, please uh, subscribe to uh, our own version of the channel because all the live uh, segments will go there. And then uh, the post-edited uh, version of the episode, we're going to do editing after we finish every episode and um, just organize things properly. Uh, we will post them on uh, the Julia Language channel, YouTube channel. Um, just quick final reminders, uh, please fill out the, I mean, I think that the survey is actually a fun survey to fill, unlike many other surveys. Uh, so yeah, we had some really uh, cool uh, comments uh, in the previous uh, time when we posted it. So the link is below, right? Did we figure out the where? It's below. The link is it? It's in the, below. Okay. In the <laughs> description. Yes. In the description. And if yeah. you're listening on Spotify, it is in the podcast description. Right, but That's also if you're listening on a third podcast. Um, Pocket cast. Pocket cast. Uh, Nathan is our first subscriber there, so uh, it's yay, my favorite Nathan. podcasting app. That's awesome. Okay, yeah. So there is also a third uh, Pocket Cast uh, platform where, where we're posting uh, things on, and I think we're in the process to get it on Apple Podcasts. So yeah, yes. we're trying to go on all uh, possible platforms. We're going uh, for podcast and, domination. Uh, yeah, and YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button, uh, share, uh, retweet, like retweet is on Twitter, sorry. Uh, just all the things people do on social media. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, did you want to say other things, Nathan and Piano? I'm good. That's it. Yeah, thanks again for everyone who tuned in. Thanks everyone who's watching us and supporting us and sending us notes. Thanks for our interviewees, uh, David, Jacob, Valentin, and Chris. And if you want to show, uh, come come on the show with us uh, for next time. Uh, don't forget to let us know. Uh, thank you for watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs>